Unsolved Mysteries. Down the ages, man has been seeking the answer to the riddle, what happens in the unseen realm beyond? With all our science, we're as far from answering that question as man was in the beginning. But with the accumulated records of the past, the conviction is borne strongly upon some that there is a link joining us mortals with those who have passed this way before. American newspaper correspondent's home. It is evening, and a group of guests are seated around the table enjoying their after-dinner coffee and cigars. The log fire casts a ruddy glow over the room, and the soft candlelight throws grotesque shadow shapes on the walls and ceiling as the guests settle themselves more comfortably in their chairs. <laughs> hey, but seriously, Bert, while well, that was a good story, well told you. You don't really believe in ghosts. Well, uh, before I answer that question, let me ask you one. Go ahead. Mm, do you completely, wholly, and absolutely disbelieve in them? Right. Oh, when you put it that way, I'm not sure that I can answer you, Bert. <laughs> I suppose in their heart of hearts, most men, while they won't admit it, do have a secret belief in ghosts or something similar. Now, what do you say, Jackson? You're a newspaper man of wide experience. Have you ever run into what you might call a true ghost story in your newspaper work? Yes, I have. An experience of my own, and one, in fact, to which I owe my life. Exactly, Jackson. It was that experience of yours that I had in mind. What is that, Jackson? Something we haven't heard about? I don't tell it to many people. But you will tell it to us. Well, why don't you, Jackson? It's going to be published next month anyway. All right. As you fellows know, I was foreign correspondent for the Sketch Mirror Group. And one of my assignments was to interview celebrities before they became celebrities. Well, I had to make a quick trip to England. It looked very much as if the Asquith government was about to fall, and that Lloyd George would be in the saddle. So I had to interview Lloyd George before the news broke. I concluded my interview and was all ready to leave when I met an old friend. He had become a lord since I first knew him, but that made no difference to him. And the result was that I found myself in their Northumberland home, being greeted by her ladyship and her very charming daughter. Cheerio there, Major. Hello, sis. I want you to both to meet a very old friend of mine, Jackson. Well, not the Mr. Jackson. The very first. Oh, I'm so glad to meet you, Mr. Jackson. Please have spoken of you so much. And I'm delighted to meet Keith's mother and sister. Oh, come, Evelyn, dear. We mustn't keep Mr. Jackson standing in the cold. We shan't want the carriage any more tonight, Dobbs. Uh, very good, sir. All right. Baxter will take your taps up. Come right into the hall and get your bones thrown out. <laughs> Thanks, old man. It is a bit silly, huh? Mm, riding up to the house here in a carriage is an experience to one accustomed to riding in a closed car. We don't use the car much up here, and tonight Arthur has it down in the village, getting in some supplies. <laughs> it was charming, even if chilly. But then this open fire makes up for all the cold. Drink, Jackson? Well, thanks, yes. Yeah. Stay one. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, yes, how? Oh, did you boys have dinner tonight? Thank you, we did, on the train. And by the way, I take back all I've ever thought or said about dinners on an English train. 
That was one of the best meals I ever had. <laughs> Possibly you were more hungry than usual. There's something I must say. Even if all the books ever written on etiquette say that it's contrary to good taste. Oh, what is that, Mr. Jackson? I'm sure we'll forgive you. Your home. It is without question the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Why, when we were driving up the hill, it looked like some picture out of a children's storybook. A picture of an old medieval castle. The drawbridge, the portcullis, the moat, the towers, and the turrets. It is somewhat of a medieval castle. The north wing was built in the days of Henry II. And each generation since has added this little bit. And we, well, we added electric lights and plumbing. The plumbing with the devout approval of the family. The electric lights against my mo- own most ardent objection. <laughs> <laughs> well, with electric lights and plumbing, I can't think of anything more to be desired. We even have one of the best ghosts in all England. Yes, my <laughs> ghost is... You might at least give a chap time to warm his feet before you drag out the family skeleton. Our ghost is not a skeleton. You shouldn't say things like that. You must forgive Evelyn, Mr. Jackson. But maybe Evelyn's ghost is, a uh, well, almost an obsession with Evelyn. <laughs> well, I'm sure that if Lady Evelyn's ghost is half as charming as you are, Miss Evelyn, then she's a ghost I'd like very much to meet. <laughs> well, thank you. Let's go to the gallery and show Mr. Jackson Lady Evelyn's portrait. No, no, my dear. I'd be delighted, really, if it isn't too much trouble. No trouble at all, Jackson. In fact, we're all tired. Since the gallery is on the way to the bedroom... Come along, Mr. Jackson. You come with me. You see, Mr. Jackson, Lady Evelyn's ghost is a very special ghost. She always warns us of any impending disaster. And do you always heed her warning? We do now. And she warned Mother about Father. Father paid no attention. He was killed. Just as the ghost warned Mother he would be. Is that the only instance? Oh, no. It's a family tradition dating back several hundred years. Here's the gallery. I'll switch on the light. Mm, no need to tell me which one. There she is. Yes. Why, it could be a portrait of you. I say, old man, don't pay too much attention to what Evelyn tells you about the family skeleton, you know. Keith is quite right, Mr. Jackson. Evelyn is unduly enthusiastic. <laughs> She's not any more enthusiastic than I am. I'm enjoying the whole thing immensely. Fact is, I'd rather like to meet this ghost, uh, Lady Evelyn. Then... Then why don't you sleep in the haunted wing? No, oh, my dear, my dear. Yes, by Jove. Invite a fellow up here, and the first time you want to stick him in the haunted wing. But Jackson did sleep in the haunted wing. The wind howled dismally among the turrets and along the roof ledge. The oak-paneled walls creaked as night wore on and the cold became more intense. One by one, the sounds in the old castle died away. Soon Jackson fell into a sound sleep. He wakened with a feeling that someone was in the room. Sat up in the big four-poster bed. A woman stood against the far wall. Uh, Miss Evelyn, dressed in old-fashioned clothes, playing the part of the ghost. But the figure shook its head, turned a pair of luminous eyes on him, and started to write on the wall. For a moment, the warning message blazed out in letters of fire. Jackson closed his eyes and, and looked again. A trick. She's writing with phosphorus or something. Again, the figure shook its head, gave him a searching look that went right through him, and turning, walked out of the room through the three-foot stone wall. By George, eight o'clock. I didn't realize I was taking so long to tell this story. We'll be late for the theater. Oh, hang the theater. Finish the story. Yes, sure. sure. Yeah. Well, I did my best to disregard the ghost warning. His lordship drove me to the boat. Or I should say he tried to, but the car broke down. I missed the boat. And two days later, Keith, with a face as white as a sheet, handed me the morning paper. In glaring headlines, I read, Steamship Titanic Sunk. All on board, lost. Of course, that was an exaggeration. But I might have been one of the more than thousand who were lost. Good Lord. What did the warning that was written on the wall say? Beware of the Titanic. Nothing more. I told her ladyship next morning, and she was the one who instructed the chauffeur when she found I was determined to sail. She instructed him to break the car, if necessary, to prevent my sailing on the Titanic. Now, do you fellows believe in ghosts? Imagination or not, Jackson, old boy, we're glad you missed the Titanic. And we're darn glad you're here to be our host at this dinner party. Now, we've got time for one toast and off to the theater. Out of deference to people who are still alive, 
character and names in these unsolved mysteries have been changed. Inasmuch as any solution must of necessity be supposition, liberties of time, place, and character exist in the solution that will be presented after you have heard from your sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, the solution for which you have been waiting. Of course, I don't blame you for believing in ghosts after an experience like that. But just the same, you can't really explain it. I think I can. I'd like to hear you. Have you ever met a perfect stranger and had the strange sensation of having met him somewhere before? Yes, certainly. Well, the same thing applies to buildings. And the older these buildings are, the more vibration of previous happenings there will be to make their effect upon you. You mean to say that if I go into a building where a murder has been committed, I'll be aware of a strange feeling? You will, if you're sufficiently sensitive. I'll agree there, but that doesn't explain actually seeing what is generally called a ghost. If you've ever tried lying down in perfect ease and comfort, allowing your imagination to drift back to some particularly memorable scene, the picture will come to you as vividly as if it had happened yesterday. Or take an author writing a story. The characters are just as real in his mind as any group of living people about whom he has only read. I'll agree to all that. Very well. Don't you think that if, over a period of centuries, people living in a certain house are all agreed that the ghost of a beautiful woman haunts the house, don't you think that that impression will impress itself very strongly upon a stranger who sleeps in the so-called haunted room? Yes, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I really do think that if a sufficient number of people all think along one line, something is going to result. And, of course, you were thinking of your trip on the Titanic as well as the ghost. So you're willing to admit that concentrated thinking will produce a manifestation. And if that's the case, why deny that an extremely emotional incident would produce a similar manifestation? Hey, there's something to that, isn't there? Yeah, you've got me almost convinced. But just the same, I'll have a stronger belief in ghosts when I meet one face to face. Well, if I ever meet a ghost, I hope it will be like the ghost of the Lady Evelyn. One that will have such good intentions bred in it that even if I'm a stranger, it will warn me of any impending disaster. Of course, the ghost of Lady Evelyn would have warned anyone who had been in the room whether or not they had had any intention of sailing on the Titanic. That part of it, I think, is coincidence. Do you? Mm -hmm. 